change is an integral part of superhero comics. It's what keeps cape comics that have been running for decades ever fresh and engaging. Without creative teams coming in to shake things up once in a while, we would definitely get bored of our favorite superhero books. But some changes to comic book superheroes seem a little too drastic. Isn't removing Doctor Strange's magic against who the character is at his mystical core? If you replace Eddie Brock with Peter Parker's former bully Flash Thompson as Venom, won't it fundamentally change the story? If a Daredevil title tugs on your heartstrings and features colorful, vibrant art, doesn't it betray the darkness and grittiness that fans have come to associate with the book? Well, no. In fact, I liked all the stories I just mentioned, including the momentary changes they introduced. Over the course of being a comic book fan, I've learned not to judge a sudden change as it is announced. Although some ideas for characters and stories are questionable, what ultimately matters is the execution of those ideas. A change can feel drastic and feel wrong on paper, but with the right timing and proper execution, result in some of the greatest comic book stories ever told. Also some of the worst. <laughs> Today, we are going to talk about one critically mixed comic book series containing one of the most controversial changes in the past decade, and why I don't think it's as bad as most people think. That's right, I'm coming to the defense of Mariko Tamaki's She-Hulk series, which had Jennifer Walters look like this instead of this. But before we talk about the series in question, we need to answer the question. Who is She-Hulk? She-Hulk first debuted in the pages of Savage She-Hulk issue 1 by Stan Lee and John Buscema. In this issue, lawyer Jennifer Walters is shot and saved by her cousin Bruce through a blood transfusion, which leads to her gaining the powers of Hulk. The series would be handed off to a different creative team for the next 24 issues, but wouldn't really impact the comic book industry in any way. The She-Hulk most people know and love today didn't originate in the Savage She-Hulk series. Rather, the character would become a superstar due to a slew of comic book series that took her to greater heights. Sensational She-Hulk by John Byrne, Steve Gerber, Walt Simonson, Brian Hitch, and more featured a confident, charming, and self-aware She-Hulk that broke fourth wall and participated in some of the silliest hijinks a superhero has ever been involved in. Dan Slott, Juan Bobilio, and Will Conrad Shialk was a party animal that took all of the weirdest legal cases that involved the superhero world. The most recent Shialk series, written by Rainbow Rowell with art by Andres Ginolet, Roge Antonio, and more, is a romantic comedy slash drama between She-Hulk and Jack of Hearts. In my opinion, what makes She-Hulk work is how different she is from the Hulk. While Bruce is dealing with trauma and mental struggles within and battling fearsome foes without, Jen is internally dealing with romantic tension and externally handling some of the weirdest court trials you've ever seen in a fictional piece of media. The contrast between She-Hulk and Hulk is what makes both characters stand out. It's what makes their dynamic so interesting and unique. For most She-Hulk fans, the worst thing that could happen to She-Hulk is if she were to be an angry, brooding beast ready to burst, a copycat of her cousin with longer hair. But what if I told you that from 2016 to 2021, She-Hulk was thought of by many fans to be an angry, brooding beast ready to burst, a copycat of her cousin with longer hair? And what if I told you that I'm here to partially defend a part of it? Look, I can see the dislikes pouring in and people checking out of the video, but I have to say that I went into the controversial She-Hulk series by Mariko Tamaki with relatively low expectations and came out of it shocked. Not because it was the best thing ever, but because it was way more interesting and sincere than I expected it to be. To be clear, I don't like the idea of She-Hulk being this anxious, depressed, and tormented individual. But given the context of what was going on with Marvel at the time and the book's unique ideas, 
I think this 16 issue Hulk slash She-Hulk series that ran from 2016 to 2018 is one of the most interesting changes to a comic book character in the last decade. The first thing that stood out to me that made this change so interesting was its timing. In 2016, the Marvel Universe was torn apart and shaken by the events of Civil War II, written by Brian Michael Bendis with art by David Marquez. It featured Iron Man and Captain Marvel on opposite sides of a moral debacle, the ramifications of which caused a war between heroes that got a lot of them hurt. One of the most affected parties in the series was Jennifer Walters, who got sent into a coma by Thanos in the first issue, and whose cousin died in the third. Let me repeat that again. In the span of three issues, She-Hulk gets pulverized by Thanos, which sends her into a coma and has to internalize the death of her cousin upon gaining consciousness. For a character that belongs to the quirkier side of the Marvel Universe, the stuff that happened to her in Civil War II was especially dark. So dark, in fact, that Marvel decided to title the next She-Hulk series, Hulk. Now, this gimmick wouldn't last long as it made fans feel like Marvel abandoned the Hulk and replaced him with She-Hulk. So due to fan backlash as well as confusion, the series would drop its name after the 11th issue to go back to being called She-Hulk. But this name change did reflect the shift in tone that the She-Hulk series had, and it was understandable. A drab, dreary rendition of She-Hulk would make some sense given the fact that she just passed to a coma and the death of a loved one. Many changes to comic book characters happen just because the writer wants to shake things up, and that's totally fine, especially if the execution is stellar. But what makes this particular change to Shilk especially unique was that it was a direct response to something that happened in a major event. Having a She-Hulk book about dealing with emotional trauma right after two heartbreaking events happened to her made the Marvel Universe feel like a living, breathing place where things that happen actually matter and have impact. But timing isn't everything. What makes fans fall in love with a change to a comic book series doesn't involve whether it was timely or not. In the end, what makes people love a comic is how well it's executed. With She-Hulk in a relatively depressing state, who was Marvel going to pick to write such an anticipated comeback? Well, they reached out to indie comics writer Mariko Tamaki through email to ask if she was interested in continuing Jennifer Walters' story under the Hulk banner, which she ended up agreeing to do. In hindsight, this was a very bold choice. Instead of choosing a comic book writer with a history of writing great superhero comics, Marvel pulled a writer with a history of working on slice-of-life graphic novels that were introspective and down-to-earth. I think this was a really cool decision on Marvel's part, a choice that displayed the desire for this new She-Hulk series to be more than a silly, action-packed romp, but a deeper, more personal look at one of Marvel's most iconic characters. Unfortunately, things wouldn't go as planned as the series would only last 16 issues. What we're left with is a departure from classic She-Hulk that has some good and bad elements. Let's start with the bad. One of the book's most evident problems that even fans of the series would agree on is its lack of visual consistency. The reason why I didn't mention any particular artist alongside Mariko Tomaki is because the book cycled through so many artists. Nico Leon provided solid art for the first arc of the series, being able to capture the weight of Jennifer Walters' internal struggle as well as the playfulness of the book's comedic moments. But after the sixth issue, consistency was thrown out the window. From issue 7 to 11, 
The series had four different artists work on the book. Thankfully, the final arc, composed of She-Hulk 159 to 163, only had two. Issues 9 and 10 particularly suffered from the constantly rotating cast of artists, with art changes in the middle of the issue. Jennifer Walters would start as a realistically rendered woman in the beginning of an issue and turn into a cartoon woman with rounder features by its end. Even if the art styles themselves have some positive aspects to them, the shift in tone as a result of the book's many visual overhauls made this She-Hulk series jarring and immersion-breaking for me at points. One thing that the series' inconsistent art also didn't help with was the action, which is pretty mediocre. A lot of us read superhero stories looking forward to their big, bombastic action sequences. We love detailed double-page spreads that showcase epic battles on a grand scale. We adore action with artistic style and direction, whether it's minimalist brawls that emphasize clear movement between two characters, or maximalist battles that drown us in the emotion and impact of a fight. Mariko Tamaki's She-Hulk series doesn't have much of that, although there are a few unique panel layouts that feature this new Grey Hulk in stylish action, fights are often standard fare and end pretty quickly. I don't think Mariko Tamaki intended to make these fights lame or unmemorable, it's just that she had a different focus for the book, an angle that I actually admire, even if it wasn't executed perfectly. What makes this series so interesting is its attempt to be more than a silly, fun superhero comic. Instead of putting Jennifer through hilarious situations to amuse readers, Mariko Tamaki makes each situation She-Hulk finds herself in a space for her to reflect and grow. The first arc of the series features Jennifer Walters handling an eviction case involving Maze Brune, a woman who was once living her best life as a fulfilled and happy wellness instructor until her business partner hired goons to kill her, which left her traumatized and scarred forever. The story sees her grow this black, gooey monster that seems to feed off her desire for protection from the world she views as harsh and cruel. Not only does Jennifer Walters have to face this terrifying creature, she also has to confront her own trauma and view of the world while trying to understand and approach her new client. By the end of issue 6, she's reassured that there is hope to be found despite life's cruelty. The second arc in the series also has Jennifer face her inner demons, but it has pretty spotty execution in my opinion, featuring inconsistent art and an uneven story. From issues 7 to 10, we witness a baking influencer get transformed into a monster during a livestream by two cringy bad guys who say the word frick way too much. Unfortunately, more of the arc is dedicated to them rather than Jennifer Walters, resulting in a less than satisfying story for me. Still, the moments that showcase her reflecting on what it means to be a monster and sympathizing with the affected victim are pretty well done in my opinion. The final major storyline sees Jennifer finally get over her PTSD. She gets kidnapped by the leader and meets an obsessed superfan by the name of Robin, who drugs and extracts blood from her in order to gain superpowers. This leads to my favorite fight scene in the series, a dramatic sequence where Shiok nearly kills Robin, and Jennifer uses desperate emotion to sway her alter ego not to go through with the execution. This close encounter prompts Jennifer to finally do something about her newfound fear of the Grey Hulk inside her, consulting with psychiatrist Flo, who had been begging to meet her since the series began. Through a therapy session that involves hypnotic tea, Jen faces her insecurities, fears, and trauma emerging victorious and spiritually healed as a result. A lot of people have issues with this last arc because Jen gets over all the trauma and distress that plagued her throughout the series in the span of a therapy session that lasts a single issue. I honestly agree with that sentiment. 
The end of this series is very abrupt and doesn't capture the long-term healing process that it takes to recover from trauma. I also thought Robin and the leader were pretty lame choices for what was supposed to be the culmination of the whole series, but all my complaints don't change the fact that I enjoyed this series as a whole. Despite its numerous visual and narrative flaws which I was fully aware of, I ultimately came away charmed by this rendition of She-Hulk. Why is that? Well, I think it has something to do with the book's unique premise and genuinely good intention. When the series first came out, a lot of fans felt like it was a malicious comic intended to trigger fans of the sexy, confident, and level-headed She-Hulk. It sure seemed that way from the covers and the comic's title, but in retrospect, that take doesn't hold much legitimacy. Mariko Tamaki and Marvel didn't intend for She-Hulk to be changed into a grey depressed bummer forever. In fact, it was kind of the opposite. Tamaki used the backdrop of Civil War II to tell an introspective story about She-Hulk going from grey back to green. A comic about recovery and finding light at the end of the dark tunnel that is PTSD. Isn't that such a wonderful idea to try and pull off? To show people that even the best of us can be damaged? but that it doesn't entail a bitter end? This book has one of the coolest premises in Marvel's recent history in my opinion, a core idea that not only had the potential to tell amazing stories, but also to help people struggling mentally. Unfortunately, the book didn't reach those heights, but even though it didn't, I think there's still value in Tamaki's She-Hulk series. There are glimpses of greatness in its pages that showed what the series was trying to achieve, whether it was the vulnerable moments that depicted Jennifer's complex emotions to great effect, or the lighter conversations with Hellcat and Bradley that were brimming with personality. Despite its flaws, I admire Mariko Tamaki's Shilk for trying to be less of a superhero story and more of its own thing. And isn't that what She-Hulk is all about? Or maybe I'm wrong and you are all going to cook me in the comments. Writing this video was difficult for me. Each time I wanted the script to go in a certain direction, there would be a contradictory opinion holding that definitive conclusion back. I admit that this video is scatterbrained and all over the place, just like Mariko Tamaki's She-Hulk, but I think that goes to show how complex comics are. While critical consensus can make it seem like art is definitively bad, or good, most media can't be encapsulated by those simple degrees of quality. Comic books have so many aspects to them that can vary in quality, and the only way to really form an opinion on a comic series is to read it for yourself. And even then, you may not be able to form a definitive opinion, but that's okay. Most art is complicated and multifaceted, and it's better to accept that fact than create one-dimensional narratives about them. Anyway, thank you so much for reaching the end of this video and for all the wonderful support last month. I cannot believe that Ryan North, the current writer of the Fantastic Four, retweeted my video about his Fantastic Four series on Twitter. Thank you so much for last month. I hope m more months like that are to come. Uh, but anyway, my name is Joshua C, and I will see you in the next one.